All right, are we up and running? Looks like we are. Let's talk about um, regression and correlation prediction. Actually, this is wrong. We're not going to talk about uh, inference so much. We're just going to talk about um, about prediction. Okay, that's better. Anyway, talking about prediction, this is just using the model we built, but we don't always do this. Uh, there are four questions that are often answered, asked with regression and correlation. The first one, almost always, what's the best model for describing the relationship in our sample? And sometimes we just look at a correlation coefficient. Sometimes we don't calculate the entire regression equation. Sometimes we just need the correlation. After that, we usually ask how good is the model. Now, the correlation coefficient itself answers that question to a large degree, and it tells us how well our model fits the data. We use the correlation coefficient, we use r-squared, we look at the residuals, if we're going to do um, an entire model fit there with the whole line and everything. So this, this uh, lecture deals with the question, how can we use the model to do some prediction? And we don't always do this, but let's talk about how to do it in case you want to. It's actually not that, e that hard. You've, you've done this in algebra class. The only thing that's l missing now is to learn how to kind of map that easy prediction business onto what we, we're doing in statistics, just using it with real data. So you just plug in some x values that aren't there in, the, in your data actually. Otherwise, why would you need, I mean, if the x values are there, then you already have a predicted y. So then you look at what y values come out, and those are predicted y values. Those aren't real y values, that's just our best prediction. That's like saying on average, if a person had this x value, we would predict that their, their value for whatever the y variable is would be such and such. So here's an example from the support data, predicting college GPA from combined SAT scores. Now not everybody took the SAT. It turns out only about 125 people have valid data for the SAT out of 400 some odd. So most people reported SAT, so let's look at, or sorry, reported ACT. So let's look at the people who reported SAT scores. So this is the regression line and scatter plot of the combined reading and math scores. So combining uh, the 200 to, to 800 possible in reading with the 200 to 800 possible in math, and you get a total combination, a total sum score of between 400 and 1600 possible. And looking at that relationship with GPA. So it's not the strongest relationship in the world. Here's the, equ the equation. Predicted GPA equals 2.59 plus 0 .0006 times SAT. This number, 0 .0006, has to be very small because, uh, let's see, <coughs> has to be very small. What happened there? OK, hello. This is really kind of weird. I see my pointer, but. It's drawing on the other side of the screen. All right, let's just pretend those squiggles aren't there. It has to be very small because um, these numbers down here, these SAT numbers, are huge. So you have to multiply by them by a very small fraction to make them small enough to be a GPA. Otherwise, that wouldn't work. So let's say right here we wanted to predict what kind of a GPA would a person have if they had a totally perfect score on the SAT. Pretty unlikely, very few people get that, but what if? Just for exploring the lows and the highs of things. So if a person has a perfect score, 1600 on the SAT, the predicted value is going to be whatever, wherever that vertical line touches the regression line, the height right there. So graphically, that's what we do. But mathematically, you just plug in, instead of saying, you know, abstract some SAT score, you plug in the actual SAT score you want to predict. So just plug in 1600 to that and do the math. And you find 3.5. So 3.5 is what we would predict. It actually turned out kind of neat. I didn't plan that. So if a person got a 1600, we would predict that their score would be 3.5, or their GPA would be 3.5. Now you see plenty of people who didn't even get 1600s have higher than 3.5. So that 3.5 is saying, on average, if a lot of people, coming from the same population, uh, if a lot of people had a 1600, our best prediction is that the average that they would get would be a 3.5 GPA. So some would be lower than 3.5, some would be higher, etc. Now there's a problem. The problem in extrapolation is just the fact that nobody has that value in your sample. So you're not exactly sure that the model's going to hold. So let's look at another example and um, 
check out and just kind of hammer this in. Let's say your GPA in this study is being predicted not by your SAT score, but by your academic self-efficacy. So the college academic self-efficacy scale has 33 Likert scale items. They ask self-efficacy is how much you think you're capable of doing something. So college academic self-efficacy is a bunch of questions about how confident you are in your ability to succeed in your classes, to talk to professors, to make friends on campus, things like that, to pass tests, write papers. How well do you think you, or how confident you are in your ability to succeed in college in general? All these Likert scale items are five points, so strongly disagree, disagree, neutral, agree, strongly agree, and they're scored one through five. And the way the scale is scored is you just, everybody gives an answer to all 33 questions, and then you add up each person's answers. You turn the strongly disagrees into one, the strongly agrees into five, etc., and you add up all the values so the person has a sum. It's a little abstract, hard to make sense of. But we can tell what the minimum would be. It would be 33, because if a person answered one to all 33 questions, then when you added up all those ones, it would be 33. And if a person answered five, like strongly agree to all those questions, they would have a 165, because five times 33 is 165. So we can put the range here on the graph from 30 down at the bottom, 33, all the way up to 160. So this is the relationship. The correlation is not terribly strong, 0.33, but that's about what we expect for educational and behavioral um, variables that are these kind of aggregate high-level variables. I'm not measuring you know, the milliseconds of, of reaction time to a bright light in a room, which would give us a much more pure variable. I'm measuring a variable that's the result of probably hundreds or thousands of different influences on a person's behavior. Self-efficacy. And GPA, boy, that's, I mean, what all goes into a GPA? Bazillions of things. So. 0.33, that's realistically uh, a reasonably good correlation to find. This is interesting to us because there's not a lot that's going to correlate that well with these very noisy variables that we have. So the predicted um, GPA is 2.1-ish plus 0.008-ish times the cases score. That's our regression line. So if, what if a person got the absolute minimum score? If this person had no confidence in their ability to succeed in college, then what would be our best prediction for what their GPA would be? Let's write there on the line. But let's work, at, work it out. Um, what if the cases score was 33? So we multiply that out. I carried things out to a few extra decimal places to make sure we were accurate here. So we would say 2.36, a 2.3, 2.4 GPA. But seriously, you really have to think. If a person honestly said to every one of those 33 questions that they had almost no confidence in their ability to do these things, like to succeed in school, like to write a paper, like to study hard, like to make friends, would they even be in college? This is the problem with extrapolation. If you, when you're going beyond the data that, are in that, that you have it there in your sample, it's very difficult to tell whether the relationships are going to hold. And I think it's pretty reasonable to think that there's almost nobody in college who would honestly give you really, really low answers there. Otherwise, if they really had no belief in their ability to succeed, they probably would not be in college. And if they were, I'm pretty sure they probably wouldn't be getting a 2.4 GPA. I mean, if you have no belief in your ability to succeed at something, you usually don't try very hard. I mean, that's from other areas of psychology and common sense. So the dangers of extrapolation um, are that you could apply a model, and then unbeknownst to you, outside your data, your model could change. The, the influences affecting your results could change, but your model doesn't re recognize that. So this is an XKCD comment, pretty funny. His health is increasing and increasing over time, until he realized he can cook bacon whenever he wants. But what if he did prediction uh, before he discovered his ability to cook bacon? then he would have predicted this health trend that just went up and up and up. And when he was, you know, 50, he would have had really excellent health. But there's a big difference between what he would have predicted and what actually happened because of bacon. So extrapolating doesn't take into account reasons why the pattern might change outside your data. And there are lots of reasons. Another reason is because some trends just are self-limiting. Not that something happens necessarily, but some trends just realistically can't keep going. So this is another XKCD. He, he's Googling um, trends in the word sustainable. It's just become a really popular word. And he's using Google tools to determine the percentage of words in published books out there that are sustainable. How, how frequent is that, that uh, word? And 
it's getting more and more and more and more popular until now. And so he just says, wow, look at that great line. Let's just extrapolate. So by the year 2109, every sentence written in the English language will be just the word sustainable repeated over and over and over again because it will be 100% of all words, which is stupid, of course, because that's not going to happen. So he's making fun of extrapolation, and he's money making fun of the word sustainable, too, in our silly popularity contest of these things. So there's always these things where people will say, like, um, if, if everybody sold Amway, this multi-level marketing company, then within you know, X number of years, the entire planet would be nothing but Amway representatives. True, but it's not going to happen because there are all sorts of reasons why not everybody on the planet is going to turn into an Amway representative. And even if Amway was even more successful than it is, a lot of people, I mean, that success itself would change the way we think about things. And some, there would be reaction. So extrapolations in small samples are even more unreliable. So that if you've got a small n and think anything less than about 30, 50, something like that, you really shouldn't be trusting these extrapolations. You should be trying to find an n of hundreds. So this comment gives you a great... <laughs> I love it. Okay. Um, and sometimes the research itself can change things. This is just an excuse for me to put this joke in there. <laughs> <laughs> where the guy says that our relationship declined and uh, and his girlfriend or boyfriend or whoever said, that's when you started graphing everything. So the research itself can cause reaction. That's probably not the biggest concern, but it was a, a cheap excuse to put a joke into my PowerPoint slides. So that's all I've got to say about prediction. We're not really going to get too much into it. We might do a prediction example in class, maybe, probably not. It's just something you can do with regression. And thanks for paying attention, and I'll do more later.